Hi, I'm actor Ian Champion, and welcome to History of Horror Cinema, my personal podcast tour of the good, bad, and the ugly of horror movie history. If you like what you hear, please don't forget to hit subscribe. The Boogie Man Will Get You, 1942 1942 was a good year for Boris Karloff. He was invigorated by the huge success and profits he made from investing and starring in the Broadway play Arsenic and Old Lace, with its farcical, macabre-edged black humor. On hiatus from the production that summer, he filmed The Boogie Man Will Get You, a daft and deft comedy to complete his contract for Columbia Pictures. The studio wanted to capitalize on his theater hit, which explains why the film's tone and content is so clearly reminiscent of it a screwball comedy of concealed bodies in a house full of blithely innocent-seeming murderers and fruitcakes played at an increasingly fast pace. Direction was by Lou Landers, who had previously partnered Karloff with Bella Lugosi in the controversial 1935 Chiller the Raven, which I previously covered, from a script rushed out in four weeks by Edwin Bloom, based on a Hal Thimberg and Robert B. Hunt adaptation of Paul Gangeland's story. Karloff portrays another in his gallery of mad scientists, Professor Nathaniel Billings, but with the refreshing variance of being a dotty and whimsical buffer, instead of the slow, portentous medics that audiences usually saw him play in straight horror titles. He is keen to sell his dilapidated old tavern, presumed to be a historically valuable property from the 18th century. A young lady, Winnie, played by Jean Marie, falls in love with the place and buys it on sight, intending to make of it a boarding house. She agrees to keep on the professor so he can continue his shady basement medical experiments that so far have caused five men to vanish without a trace. Also retained are Billings' cuckoo housekeeper Amelia, Maud Eben, who appeared in 1930's The Bat Whispers and The Vampire Bat, and crotchety farmer Ebenezer, George Mackay. Winnie is unconcerned, indeed charmed, by the evident dry rot and run-down conditions. So too is her guest, the prissy, coke-bottle-bespectacled J. Gilbert Brampton, Don Beddo, a most unlikely ballet choreographer. Winnie is less enamored at the sudden reappearance of her ex-husband Bill, who's come to save her from what he feels is a poor business decision on his way to begin army training. As Bill, Larry Parks is a winningly energetic pest, Pratt falling and gamely suffering the emerging nuttiness around him. He would go on to be Oscar-nominated for the first of his famous roles as Al Jolson in 1946's The Jolson Story, followed by Jolson Sings Again in 1949, before his confessed Communist Party membership in front of the HUAC committee led him to testifying on others, yet still being ruinously blacklisted himself regardless. The perceived villain of this piece is none other than Peter Lorre, having fun as Dr. Lawrence. Being the holder of the crippling mortgage on Billings's property is just one of his murky skills. Apparently, he is also a scientist who scorns the other's work, what Billings defends as shaking the unshakable laws of existence yet whose own achievements are restricted to inventing a dubious hair restorer. Somehow, coming from Lorre, this background seems entirely believable. Lawrence is also the town's health officer and sheriff, leading us to surmise he is a low-level kingpin with his fingers in many pies. His garb of black broad-brimmed hat, black suit and short tie has the exact look of Robert Mitchum's dangerous preacher in 1955's Night of the Hunter though Lawrence is more buffoon than serious threat. Laurie and Karloff soon team up again to our pleasure as quasi-crime partners like they did in their previous comedy double act in You'll Find Out, which I've covered. Once Lawrence realizes there may be more depth than he thought to Billings' scientific quackeries, enjoy Laurie's comic timing when he almost deflects any implied impugning that his motives would cheat millions of people all over the world? Profane my profession? Suppose I make a few dull. Billings confides in Lawrence his batty proposition that with his cellar's cabinet of wires and a skull cap, he can induce the power of flight in a victim as a weapon in the war effort. He would destroy Berlin. He would throttle Tokyo. By the time we see Amelia on the landing, clucking like a hen and telling Winnie, 
I just laid my 214th egg. We are hard-pressed to figure out who the real lunatics are. Visiting this madhouse is Slapsy Maxi Rosenblum, the real-life former world light heavyweight boxing champion who became a much-loved character actor and owner of the famous Slapsy Maxi's Comedy Club. He is perfectly cast as an amusingly incongruous powder puff salesman, who is promptly knocked out as a fresh subject for Billings and Lawrence's experiments. This one will fly. I can feel it, enthuses Karloff as they carry him away. Gradually, the crazy freight train of the plot builds a head of steam with Mr. Johnson, Billings' opening test subject in the film, presumed dead, and olfactorily challenged Maxie inviting the scientists and the two ex-lovers to smell the chloroform that he can't, crumpling them to the floor. Following the body count of seeming dead and apparently unconscious is muddled in the exposition, but the lively farce speeds amiably over such details. One last whack-job character joins the parade in the shape of Frank Pulia as Silvio, an escaped aviator prisoner of war from a Canadian camp who demands a safe haven and transport to blow up a munitions plant. He's so insane that he could pass for an anarchist revolutionary rather than part of any organized Axis power plot. I'm a human bomb! Pulia made some notable minor film appearances as an actor and but for illness would have been immortalized in The Godfather as Undertaker Bonacera, an irony considering that in that film the character he would have played believed in America with an immigrant's passion, whereas here he is hell-bent on its destruction. We are on the brink of annihilation, he crows, lighting his own fuse in more ways than one. The humor in The Boogeyman Will Get You is of various types, and mostly works well performed by an integrated cast fully in on the joke. There are physical action sight gags, both concrete and surreal, such as the actual sound effect thump when Amelia mimes the baby Billings being dropped on his head, and whimsical one-liners. He seems quite well done, observes Brampton coolly, as Maxie falls out of the cabinet after being experimented upon. It turns out that the implausible choreographer's peculiar snooping around during events is due to his true identity as curator of the Historical Society of America. He happily certifies that the erstwhile couple's going concern is now approved as a genuine piece of history. Meanwhile, the group as a whole are looking at certification of a different sort by the arriving police, as crackpots headed for Idle Wild Sanatorium. This phases Lawrence no more than the bumping off of their victims for the cause of science, all of whom have inexplicably revived. Added to his already fulsome resume, he reveals, I am the chairman of the board of directors. The boogeyman will get you is fun candy floss fluff, sinister goings on without heavy consequences, and a nice change of gear for Karloff in the midst of his run of lugubrious medical madmen. Thanks for listening. If you like what you hear, please don't forget to hit subscribe.